Greetings from Palestine. I'm happy to be speaking for the first time at Stanford while not being at Stanford physically due to the travel ban imposed on me by the Israeli authorities effectively. But I shall address you even from afar and my words will reach you regardless of their bans. Uh, I'll talk about the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement for Palestinian rights and Israel's main response to this movement in the last couple of years, which is fostering an environment of McCarthyism. Um, I, I will first address the roots of the BDS movement, what we're calling for, uh, what we've done in the last 10 years to make Israel's regime of oppression so um, uh, concerned and to threaten us uh, as a result. The Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions or BDS movement was established by the absolute majority of Palestinian civil society in 2005. By that we mean political parties, trade union movements, uh, women's movements, uh, uh, farmers, academics, writers, students, youth, and so on and so forth, uh, among Palestinians in historic Palestine as well as Palestinians in exile including the large refugee community. So BDS calls for the three basic rights without which Palestinians cannot exercise our inalienable right to self-determination. Those three rights are an end to the occupation of 1967, which includes the wall and the colonies that Israel has illegally established in the occupied Palestinian territory, as well as occupied Syrian territory, uh, of course. Number two, ending Israel's system of racial discrimination, which amounts to apartheid by the UN definition of the term apartheid. And third and foremost, the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes of origin, from which they were ethnically cleansed systematically uh, during the Nakba, the, the violent establishment of the state of Israel on top of the ruins of Palestinian society. The reason why we're calling for all three of these rights and not just ending the occupation, which is more understood, especially in the United States, is because we do not shape our rights according to what's convenient uh, to any audience. Those are our rights, our inherent rights as a people under international law. Uh, second, because the Palestinian people are made up of three main constituencies, if you will. Uh, the largest is Palestinians uh, in exile, as well as the Palestinian refugee community, whether inside Palestine or outside. Uh, together, they constitute 68% of the Palestinian people are refugees, again, inside and outside. Uh, but if we go into the ge geographic divisions, Palestinians in the occupied West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem, are 38% of the Palestinian people. Palestinians who are citizens of the present-day state of Israel are 12%, and 50% of the Palestinians are in exile, not allowed to go home simply because they're the wrong type. As a human rights movement that is anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and international law precepts, we advocate the basic rights of all Palestinians, and this is a movement that's built on the premise that all Palestinians, whether in historic Palestine or in exile, are entitled by law uh, and by ethical principles, obviously, to participate in the right to self-determination. It's not, we cannot reduce the Palestinian people only to those in the West Bank and Gaza, as the uh, Oslo Agreement has attempted uh, to do. To achieve those three basic rights, ending the occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return, uh, BTS adopted uh, strategies and tactics that evolved from decades of Palestinian popular resistance, as well as uh, uh, they were inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, very deeply inspired by that movement, and the US civil rights movement. To achieve those uh, three rights under international law, we've called for isolating Israel's regime of occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid, academically, culturally, economically, financially, militarily, and so on, as was done against the apartheid regime in South Africa. Since 2005 to the present day, 10 and almost 11 years, uh, BDS uh, has achieved quite a lot more than we had initially anticipated when we launched the movement in 2005. Uh, there are many reasons for that. 
But one important uh, point to remember is that in comparison to the South African boycott, the boycott against South African apartheid, we are going much, much faster. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and others have commented on the pace of growth and, and growth of the impact of the BDS uh, movement. Uh, part of it has to do with learning the lessons of the South African uh, example, the case in South Africa. Uh, another has to do with technology, the internet, uh, social media, and so on, uh, and uh, the advent of which they did not have in, in South Africa. There are many other factors, in, including the centrality of Israel in the Western discourse, the protection Israel gets from the United States uh, government and Western Europe, and, and so on. Uh, uh, regardless, uh, BDS has been growing at a very, very quick rate, despite the massive obstacles that are uh, on its path to freedom, justice, and equality for the Palestinian people. I'll, I'll talk a bit about some of the successes uh, we've had, reaching to the last couple of years, and the dramatic shift in Israel's attitude towards the BDS movement. After several years of achieving academic successes, the cultural successes with artists cancelling performances in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv looking increasingly like Sun City, the resort uh, that was uh, boycotted by most decent artists uh, during apartheid South Africa, Tel Aviv today is the Sun City of yesterday. Um, um, so increasingly, a number of artists and, and bands are looking at Tel Aviv that way. Uh, academics around the world, especially in the United States, with many uh, academic associations, have, have started to adopt the academic boycott of Israel, which is an institutional boycott that targets institutions rather than individuals. Because BDS is, is based on uh, isolating a regime of oppression because it's oppressing us and denying us our rights, not based on identity. So our movement is based on complicity, not identity, if you will. We couldn't care less about the identity of the oppressor so long as they are oppressing us. Um, so the Asian American Studies Association, American Studies Association, National Women's Studies, Indigenous Studies, uh, um, uh, African Literature, and, and, and several, uh, and, and hopefully the American Anthropological Association uh, will vote for the academic boycott resolution uh, as the voting is happening now. Uh, this is a growing movement among academics in the US, among academics in South Africa, Brazil, uh, Britain, Ireland, uh, uh, and elsewhere, among artists as well. But Israel initially dismissed all those uh, successes as, uh, uh, as a nuisance. This cannot impact such a powerful regime as Israel's with its nuclear weapons and, and massive arsenal, military arsenal and enormous US support, billions of dollars of your tax money supporting this regime of oppression. So why should Israel worry about a human rights, nonviolent movement led by Palestinians that is uh, uh, affecting some artists, bands, and academics here and there? That was their initial reaction. Although, while saying that, they launched the Brand Israel campaign in 2005 less than a year after the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel was established. So clearly they felt the danger, but not yet, uh, not yet at the level that they see it today. That is a danger to a regime of oppression. Um, the Brand Israel campaign was established to present Israel's uh, um, image as a liberal democratic state with advanced uh, uh, technology and, and uh, vivid society and, and so on and so forth, basically whitewashing or covering up uh, Israel's uh, oppression and denial of, of Palestinian rights. Uh, it takes many forms, uh, pink washing, green washing, all kinds of washing, using gay rights, environmental uh, issues and, and other aspects to cover up its, its regime of oppression. Whatever washing Israel does, one thing is, is for sure, there's a lot of dirty, dirty laundry to be washed. That is Israel's uh, record of crimes and criminality against the people of Palestine. But uh, since 2013, Israel started to change its tone about the BDS movement. It started to see an impact on its economy for the first time. So we started to see very large corporations considering pulling out of the Israeli economy because of their involvement in uh, uh, um, projects that violate international law. 
Um, and Israel started to see pension funds in Europe, increasingly in the US as well, pulling out, uh, pulling their investments out of companies that are involved in Israel's occupation and violations of Palestinian rights. Uh, then this shift from the largely quote-unquote symbolic impact of BDS in the academic and cultural sphere, possibly some sporting sphere as well, into the economic sphere, the impact in the economic sphere, uh, alarmed the establishment in Israel, the government, the intelligence, yeah, and so on. So as of 2013, they started to view BDS as, quote, a strategic threat. Um, again, a threat to what? Uh, and we'll get to that point uh, uh, in a minute. But since 2013, we started to see some impact, uh, uh, very clear impact on the economy. I'll just give a few examples for you to get an idea. Um, the second largest pension fund in the Netherlands, PGGM, in 2014, pulled all its investments from the top five Israeli banks because of their involvement in Israel's illegal occupation and settlements. Uh, so did the Luxembourg Sovereign Fund. And most recently, the United Methodist Church pulled its investments in Israeli banks and put all Israeli banks on a no investment list, which was an extremely important turning point for the United Methodist Church uh, pension management, uh, pension uh, fund. Uh, we also saw in 2014, the Presbyterian Church divest from HP, Caterpillar and Motorola Solutions and endorse a boycott of Israeli settlement goods. Uh, United Church of Christ uh, followed suit and several other church denominations in the US started to adopt similar language as well as some churches in Canada. Um, this is uh, growing, this, this divestment from companies involved in the occupation has grown a lot. Uh, we also started to see some major corporations like Veolia the, the large French corporation that's involved in water, sewage, transportation, and other areas. Uh, uh, after seven years of campaigning against Veolia, uh, which we launched in November 2008, in September 2015, Veolia pulled out entirely from the Israeli market, where it was involved in several projects that completely and very obviously violate international law. Um, so Veolia lost billions of dollars worth of tenders and contracts uh, in Sweden, the United Kingdom, Norway, the United States, Kuwait, and other countries until it reached that decision that it was not worth it. And this is a very important point. For those large corporations uh, that are starting to pull out of Israel, they never say we're pulling out of, because of BDS. They say, oh, we pulled out because of financial considerations. Da, exactly. That's what BDS does. We make it untenable for you to continue profiting from denying our rights, from violating our rights. We hurt your bottom line so that you stop being complicit in Israel's violations of our rights. That's exactly how the logic of BDS works. So it is financial, obviously. Um, after uh, Veolia, we saw Orange, the massive uh, telecommunications uh, corporation, pull out of the Israeli market as well by ending its relationship with an Israeli company, Partner Communications, that was involved, uh, that is involved in settlements. We also saw CRH, the largest building materials company in Ireland, pull out uh, its investments from Israel. And uh, lately, G4S, the largest security company in the world, announced that it would leave Israel within 12 to 24 months. But major corporations are major liars. We never trust them. We continue campaigning until we actually see the back of their door, back of their, uh, their, their, seeing their backs going out of the door. So we shall continue campaigning against G4S until it ends actually on the ground its involvement. And even then, we shall continue to support other campaigners against G4S, because G4S does not just violate Palestinian rights. It violates uh, uh, black and Latino rights in the United States it, with its detention centers uh, of, of immigrants, of asylum seekers in the United States, in Europe, in many countries, South Africa and many countries around the world. G4S is known, uh, has, a, has a reputation for violating human rights and international law in all these countries. So building on the intersectionality that exists, that, that common understanding of a common enemy, 
and building organic relationships of, of common solidarity with various groups makes it uh, incumbent upon us, even after some of those companies abandon the Israeli market and end their involvement in violating our rights, we shall continue to work with groups like Black Lives Matter, Dream Defenders, and the various Latino and Chicano groups in the United States to fight G4S, to fight for their rights against those large corporations that are profiting from denying rights to, to the various uh, communities around the world. But going back to the economic impact of BDS, with all these pension funds uh, divesting, banks in Europe pulling out of relations with Israeli banks, and so on and so forth, uh, we started to see a real impact. A United Nations um, report in 2015 revealed that uh, foreign direct investment in the Israeli economy in 2014 plummeted in comparison to 2013 by about 46 percent. That's almost half of the foreign direct investment dropped between 2013 to 2014. This is extremely significant because Israel's economy relies tremendously on foreign uh, investment. One of the co-authors of that UN report, who happens to be an Israeli academic, attributed this massive uh, um, uh, decrease in foreign direct investment in Israel to two factors. Israel's war on Gaza in 2014 and the growth of the boycott movement, as she put it. Um, so with the domino effect of corporations abandoning their illegal projects in Israel and uh, 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 credit agencies like Moody's acknowledging that BDS, if it keeps growing, might have a, a substantial impact on Israel's economy. Uh, corporations like Rand in the United States coming up with, coming up with surveys uh, and studies showing that uh, BDS might cost Israel in the next 10 years, 1 to 2 percent of its GDP annually. In 10 years, that amounts to about 28 to 56 billion dollars. That basically offsets is the United States' uh, uh, entire aid package to Israel in 10 years. So imagine that this soft, non-violent human rights movement that's global and led by Palestinian civil society can affect Israel's economy to the extent that we can offset the entire uh, U.S. aid to Israel, which is the, the, one of the main reasons why Israel's regime of oppression is able to maintain uh, its denial of Palestinian rights. Uh, so you can offset the guilt of your tax money being used to support this oppressive system by supporting the BDS movement. That's a very important way uh, to do something about uh, where your tax money is going, and you cannot control where your tax money is going to a large extent. But uh, no resistance comes cheap or for free. There's always a price to be paid, uh, including effective international solidarity with the Palestinian rights, as in the BDS uh, movement in the United States. We're seeing uh, um, unprecedented backlash by Israel. Since February 2014, Israel's uh, far-right government, which got even more far-right in 2015's election, decided that because BDS is uh, having such a strategic impact, it is time to change strategies. So it's an admission of failure, basically, that their strategy since 2005 till 2014 failed and therefore they had to develop a new strategy based on legal warfare trying to delegitimize bds from above after having failed to do anything about it from the grassroots level we're winning hearts and minds and therefore israel is resorting to mobilizing its uh, bought uh, politicians as thomas friedman called them uh, bought and paid for politicians in the united states in europe and, and elsewhere mobilizing those to enact a legislation to delegitimize BDS from above. Um, that's one aspect of the new strategy, increased intelligence, uh, espionage. So Israel basically told the US and Western Europe, we shall spy on your citizens. And we haven't heard a peep from the US State Department, from Federica Mogherini, the, the equivalent of Secretary of State of the EU, and so on. Um, 
The, other, the third aspect is more funding for Israel's propaganda campaign, the Brand Israel campaign. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent on propaganda, sending Israeli uh, music groups, dance companies, uh, technology experts, academics, completely funded by the state, to, quote, present Israel's prettier face. So people would think about it in, in, in positive uh, terms. So it's investing even more in, in brand Israel camp campaigning to counter BDS. But the most alarming part is the legal warfare. Uh, and Israel has been investing quite a lot in that in the last couple of years, especially in the last year. Uh, Israel, as uh, many of you would know, is trying to pass legislation after legislation in states across the United States, making BDS basically illegitimate or, or, or trying to, uh, to issue statements, if not laws, that condemn BDS with all sorts of uh, smears and accusations. Uh, the most common is that it's, um, uh, it's an anti-Semitic movement, discriminates against Jews, uh, um, it, it it seeks the destruction of Israel, which is a U.S. Uh, a partner, and, and so on and so forth. If you look at all these uh, charges and all these uh, smears, it would be so easy for a sixth grader anywhere in the world to refute them. So I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. But Israel does not uh, rely on logic. I mean, they never relied on logic in pushing their agenda in the United States. They rely on buying politicians and their massive propaganda machine in the US media uh, um, and in Hollywood to an extent. Um, so they don't need to argue, they don't need to debate. In fact, they avoid debate like the plague. They never agree to debate us. Uh, um, arch Zionist supporters of Israel and uh, those opposed, who oppose Palestinian rights would not agree to debate us easily because they know uh, if it's logic versus logic, they lose. If it's argument versus argument, they lose. We always win at, at the grassroots level because it's much easier to defend justice than to defend injustice. It's much easier to advocate equality than to advocate apartheid. So their case is really, really difficult to argue. So they don't need to argue. They push from above. And that's what's fostering a new McCarthyism across the US. It's not like the US was this perfect uh, um, uh, uh, paradise that was a perfect democracy uh, and Israel is corrupting it. I, I do not support that kind of argumentation. Uh, you know the US better than I, so I won't go into that, but the US has enough of its own problems in terms of racial justice issues, economic justice, gender justice, uh, uh, justice for the indigenous people, the native population of the United States, and so on and so forth. But Israel is adding to all that. It's amplifying this McCarthyism. Trying to suppress boycott as illegitimate goes against decades of uh, a very, very long heritage of boycotts in the United States as protected speech, as protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. In fact, the 1982 case of a Claiborne Hardware Company against the NAACP ended up with the NAACP asserting its right to boycott Claiborne over its racist uh, policies. And that was decided by the US Supreme Court that boycotts to affect economic, social, and political change are perfectly legitimate free speech that is protected by the US Constitution. That will be Israel's main challenge. If it were to go to court to say a BDS advocate in New York, let's say, should be um, shunned by the state, should not be contracted, should be blacklisted by the state of New York because she supports BDS, and we go to court, it would reach all the way up to the Supreme Court, we shall win. They have no legal ground to stand on. And that's very important to remember. In more repressive societies in Europe, like France, their case might be a bit easier because it's a very corrupt legal system there and we don't have time to argue about that. But in the US at least, there's a constitutional protection for free speech that we should uh, use. Um, the, one of the most important points that Israel uh, argues against BDS with is anti-Semitism. That uh, this is a movement that wants to end Israel as it is, 
uh, wants to destroy Israel, I think they use that argument, and therefore it's anti-Jewish, it's anti-Semitic. Any boycott of Israel is by definition anti-Jewish, and therefore anti-Semitic, and therefore it has to be banned. That's the very simplistic, superficial logic they use, and again, they don't rely on logic. But let's try to, to unpack that. What Israel is saying is that if you oppose Israeli policies, Israeli apartheid, occupation, colonization, and, and so on, and you call for effective nonviolent measures to stop that and to assert Palestinian rights under international law, any such accountability measures would, by definition, be anti-Jewish. If you oppose Israel, you're automatically opposing the Jews. And I think this, is, this in itself is an anti-Semitic argument because it equates Israel with the Jews. It puts all Jews in one basket, one monolithic basket, entirely, completely represented by Israel. That is anti-Semitic. Anyone who, who denies diversity among Jewish communities around the world and puts all Jews in one basket is an anti-Semite. Let's make no mistake about that. So Zionists, when they make those arguments, is Israel, when it makes this argument, they fall into the anti-Semitic trap. So we should reject that out of hand. Um, the second point is that BDS has always consistently been anchored in international law and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and therefore rejects all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism. We're not shy about that. We're very categorical, we're very, we're very explicit, and we make it very consistently in all, language, all languages across the world. We do not work with anti-Jewish racists or any racists of any type, uh, in fact, because this is a human rights movement that believes in equal rights for all humans, irrespective of identity. That's why Jewish support for BDS is growing tremendously, especially in the United States. One of the Israel lobbies, the soft lobbies, J Street, uh, in 2014 did a poll of Jewish American opinion, and they found out something very interesting. 46% um, of all non-Orthodox Jewish American men support a full boycott of Israel. That's almost half men under 40, that is. Half Jewish American men under 40 who are non-Orthodox would support a full boycott of Israel. So just imagine this number. Recent polls have shown close to half of the Democratic Party's base would support sanctions or worse against Israel over its occupation and settlement policy. So the, the, the mood is changing, the discourse is changing, despite the mainstream media bias, despite the Hollywood bias, despite your politicians being so corrupt uh, 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 and groveling to Israel's interests rather than your interests. Despite that, this movement is growing a lot, with a lot of Jewish support and black support and Latino and queer uh, uh, women's support, anti-war support, and, and environmental support, and so on and so forth. If you just look at your own Stanford's uh, student government resolution supporting divestment uh, last year, I, I believe, the coalition that led that uh, campaign for divestment was just uh, so inspiring to see such a huge coalition of Asian groups, Latino, Black, uh, queer, Jewish, uh, and so on and so forth, all working with SJP, with Palestinian solidarity groups, to present a divestment resolution. Because people see injustice in Palestine as injustice anywhere else, as they saw injustice in South Africa, and they want to do something about it, especially since their institution, in this case Stanford, is deeply complicit through its academic relations with Israeli universities that are involved, uh, uh, deeply involved, in human rights violations and war crimes even, um, exchange programs, research programs, especially military research uh, programs, and so on and, and so forth, and its investment fund being invested in companies that perpetuate uh, the denial of Palestinian rights. Because of all that, there's a responsibility for the Stanford community, academics as well as students, to do something to end their institution's complicity in denying Palestinian rights. If you think of it this way, then what comes to mind is Martin Luther King's uh, uh, statement that boycott at a basic level is basically withdrawing support from an evil system, withdrawing cooperation with an evil system. Think about that. That's not heroic. That's a profound moral obligation. So we're not asking you for charity when we say we, we, we're appealing to you to support BDS. We're not asking for charity. At a basic level, we're asking you 
the, to end, to do your best to end the complicity of your institutions with the regime of occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid, that's denying our basic rights. That is a profound moral obligation to counter Israel's uh, induced McCarthyism and to, to fight together against all forms of injustice, including racial, economic, social, and other forms of injustice, we've got to stick together because they are sticking together, our enemies, large corporations, the, the military, security, industries, the oil companies, they're sticking together. They know their interests, and so do we. And it's time we worked together. Thank you.